Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our nerve physiology playlist. In the last video, I have talked about the resting membrane potential. Today, we'll talk about the nernest potential and Goldman's equation. With that said, now let's get started. In this physiology series, please watch these videos in order. Let's answer the question of the previous video. The figure below represents a neuron. You don't say. Which of the following regions is the highest concentration of sodium channels per square area or per square micrometer? Right, what's the answer here? Most people said, oh, the answer is C, the axon HELOC. Well, no, it's not C. Let me explain. First, let's remove the myelin and let's compare between point number one, the HELOC of the axon, and point number two, just a random point of the axon. If this was the question, of course, one will be the correct answer. However, the presence of myelin changes the equation. Look at this, thick and myelinated, 100 meters per second. Look at B, thin and myelinated, 10 meters per second conduction velocity. Unmyelinated and thin, one. So let's compare between thin and thin, okay? This one has myelin and this one does not. I just want to see the effect of myelin on the fiber. Oh, myelin increased the conduction velocity 10 times. Some textbooks will say up to 50 times. So it is true that the axon helix is more excitable than this area. However, when you add the myelin, this node of L'Envier becomes about 10 to 50 times more excitable than this. In other words, C might be more excitable than D, but the presence of myelin makes E the most excitable area because this is the node of L'Envier. Because myelin is an insulator. Okay, hey, I want to get excited. I'm sorry, you can't. Uh, I'm insulating you. How about this? I want to get excited. No, no, no. Uh, how about this? I want to get excited. Nope, you're insulated. How about this? Yeah, you have to wait until you reach the node of Rambier. That's why the nerve impulse is jumping, so to speak. Therefore, in a myelinated fiber, nodes of Rambier are the most excitable parts. Let's review nuggets of medicine. Nugget number one, why do you need the action potential? Because action potential is life. Inside your body, the nerve impulse is unidirectional. The nerve impulse starts at the axon HELOC. During resting state or the polarized state or the resting membrane potential, the inside is more negative compared to the outside. But upon activation or depolarization, the reverse is true. Since type C fibers are thin and unmyelinated, they are the first to be affected by local anesthetics. However, hypoxia affects type A fibers first because they are the most active, metabolically speaking, and they are far away from the vasa nervosa. So pressure or hypoxia will affect A before B before C. However, local anesthetics is the other way around. The word chrono means time. That's why chronexia is the time needed by a current whose intensity is double the rear base to excite the nerve. During rest, it's called the resting membrane potential. Upon stimulation, well, it depends. If you give me enough stimulation, called threshold, I'll give you the action potential. But if you give me sub-threshold or sub-minimal stimulus, I'll give you a local response. I cannot give you action potential because I follow the all or none law. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. What doesn't cause an action potential because it's sub-threshold will at least lead to a local response. During rest, the inside is negative. Why is this? Because potassium is leaving. During rest, the inside is negative. Why? Potassium efflux. When the positive is leaving, the inside becomes more negative. This is negative 70 millivolt. When I say negative, I mean the inside is negative. We're talking from the perspective of the inside of the neuron. Upon activation or depolarization, well, sodium starts rushing in. Sodium is positive. The inside becomes positive. 40 millivolts. Next, we're done with the activation. Let's go back to rest called repolarization. All right, sometimes we go too far instead of going from positive 40 to negative 70. Oh, we went to negative 80. Too far. How do we reverse this? Well, some of the potassium that you have pushed to the outside start bringing to the inside by the inward rectifying potassium channel. Resting membrane potential is negative 70 if you are a medium-sized neuron. To understand the Nernest equation and the Goldman equation, suppose that we are talking about a large nerve fiber with a resting membrane potential of negative 90. What causes the resting membrane potential? What causes the negative 90? Two things, selective permeability of the membrane to sodium and potassium, specifically potassium, and the sodium potassium ATP pump. Let's start by selective permeability. The membrane is permeable to potassium and sodium, but the membrane is impermeable to others. 
Potassium is leaving, potassium is leaving during rest, leaving the inside more negative. But also sodium is moving in during rest. However, it is minuscule when you compare it to the potassium efflux. The potassium efflux during rest is 20 to 100 times greater than the amount of the sodium influx. Why is the potassium leaving during rest? Because the potassium inside is greater than the potassium outside, 140 to 4. Put differently, the amount of potassium inside the cell is 35 times the amount of potassium outside. So of course potassium is gonna leave according to the concentration gradient. How about sodium? Well, sodium is the most abundant ion in the extracellular fluid. 140 outside, only 14 inside. Put differently, the amount of sodium outside is 10 times the amount of sodium inside, leading to sodium influx. Normally, there is more sodium outside and there is more potassium inside. The sodium-potassium ATPase pump is a primary active transporter. Translation, it requires energy and it happens against the electrochemical gradient. Why do we have more sodium on the outside? It's thanks to the sodium-potassium pump. Why do we have more potassium on the inside? It's thanks to the same pump. The sodium-potassium pump will take three sodium from the inside and two potassium from the outside and then it will rotate forcing the sodium to the outside and the potassium to the inside. Three sodium efflux, two potassium influx. The end result is they are pushing more positive to the outside, which is as if you're pushing more negative to the inside, making the inside of the membrane more negative. Hashtag resting membrane potential. So the resting membrane potential, is it caused more by the potassium efflux or the sodium influx? The potassium efflux, ergo, the polarized state is caused by the potassium efflux. The polarized attitude is by potassium abandoning the cell. Which factor is more important? The selective permeability. During the resting membrane potential, potassium is leaving, sodium is entering. Which one is more important? The potassium efflux or the sodium influx? The answer is potassium efflux. How do you know? Nernest told me. Next, what causes the resting membrane potential? Selective permeability and the sodium potassium ATPase. Which one is more important? The selective permeability. How did you know? Goldman informed me. We have talked about this equation in the previous video. This is similar to Goldman, but not identical. Basically, you're trying to measure what the potential difference across member. I want to reach the negative 90. Okay, the negative 90 is made of what? Mostly potassium and some sodium, some calcium, some chloride. Who cares? But this is the most important one. GK is the potassium conductance and the GT is the membrane conductance, aka permeability. When you have sodium problems, you get CNS problems, but calcium problems, you will end up with muscle or cardiac problems. The rule of fours is very important. What's the normal sodium in your blood? 140. How about chloride? 104. Carbon dioxide? 40. Bicarbonate, 24. pH is 7.4. Potassium is just 4. Phosphate, 4. Albumin is 4. To understand the Nernest equation like a pro, let's start with some simple math tricks. Suppose that A is directly proportional to B, and A is inversely proportional to C. Is it fair to say that A is proportional to B over C? Absolutely. What if I want to remove this proportional sign and replace it with an equal? You can do this, but you have to say equal constant times b over c. So you replace this with equal constant times. Don't believe me? Consider the pH equation, aka the henderson hasselbalch equation. A is proportional to B over C. Okay, pH is proportional to bicarbonate over the carbon dioxide. In other words, as bicarbonate pile up in your blood, so instead of 24, it became 30. Now this is getting more alkalotic. pH will go up, which means there is a direct relationship between bicarbonate and pH. Conversely, there is an inverse relation between carbon dioxide and pH. What if I want to remove this sign and replace it with equal? Yeah, equal constant times this. And the constant here is the pKa plus logarithm of whatever is here. When you see this, what does that mean? It means as bicarbonate goes up, pH will go up. They are directly related to each other. And as carbon dioxide goes up, pH goes down. They are inversely related. Notice this is a positive sign, not a negative one. 
when you see this format with a positive log here, okay, pH is directly proportional to the numerator and inversely proportional with the denominator. Beautiful. Nernest equation is the same thing. When you look at this, see, look at this thing here. E equals 61 times log, something in the numerator and something in the denominator. It means that E and the concentration outside are directly proportional, but E and the concentration inside are inversely proportional. Makes perfect sense. Notice that this is a positive 61. This is not negative 61. In the previous video, we have talked about hypokalemia and hyperkalemia. So let's imagine that normally the inside of the membrane is negative 90 millivolts during rest. Now let's talk about hypokalemia. What is hypokalemia? Less potassium outside. Therefore, it's as if I have more potassium inside. What's going to happen to the gradient? Oh, you are steepening or increasing the gradient, which will lead to more potassium leaving the cell because there is more potassium inside compared to the outside, pushing more potassium outwards. When more positive is leaving the cell, the inside is becoming more negative. So instead of negative 90, you're becoming negative 120, for example. This was the effect of hypokalemia. Conversely, the effect of hyperkalemia is you have more potassium outside, making it harder to push the potassium to the outside, decreasing the gradient, decreasing the efflux, less positive going out, less negative staying in. The inside is becoming more positive. So instead of negative 90, let's make it negative 50 or something. Hypokalemia will make the inside more negative, which means what? You are pushing me away from the threshold. Oh, I was negative 90 in normal cases. Now I'm negative 120. I'm far away from the threshold. It is harder for me to activate and to depolarize and to give you an action potential. Decreasing action potential. That's why patients with hypokalemia have a muscle weakness. If the nerves are not firing, the muscles will not respond because nerves feed muscles. On the other hand, hyperkalemia, more positive. Oh, you're bringing me closer to the threshold. It's easier for me to climb and activate. This increases depolarization, and that's why hyperkalemia can lead to tachyarrhythmia and cardiac arrest. So we agree that during rest in normal situations, I should be negative 90 on the inside. But in hypokalemia, what's going to happen? The inside is becoming more negative. Why is this? Because when I have hypokalemia, hypokalemia, what does that mean? Decrease the concentration of potassium outside. What's going to happen to E, which is the potential difference? It's going to decrease, which means I'm becoming more negative. Instead of negative 90, I'm becoming negative 120. And that's why Nernest is a freaking genius. Conversely, hyperkalemia, you have more potassium on the outside. So potassium outside is going up, 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 up. What's going to happen to the potential difference? Increasing. Instead of negative 90, I'm becoming negative 50, for example. So here's the basic idea. E is directly proportional to the concentration outside. And E is inversely proportional to the concentration inside. Put them together, you have it like this. Replace this sign with an equal, and you have to add a constant. The constant here is 61, positive 61, times log. And this is the whole idea behind the Nernest equation. Nothing more, nothing less. So the reason you have never understood it before is not because you're a bad student. It's just your professor sucks at math. That's why he went to medical school. Another math trick. Let's say that x equals negative log a over b. This is exactly the same thing as saying that x equals the positive log of b over a. They are exactly the same. By the same token, if I say x equals negative log the inside surface over the outside surface, you can change the negative into a positive and make it the outside surface on the inside surface. Okay. In reality, when I say that the resting membrane potential is negative 90, am I talking from the perspective of the inside surface or the outside surface? Well, since you're talking about nerve physiology, uh, I'm more concerned on uh, what's happening inside the nerve. So I'm talking about the inside. Okay, perfect. So let's keep the inside on the top. Okay, so I will prefer this format to this format. Why? Because I want to start with the inside because I care more about it. It just looks better. So here is the Nernest equation. You can write it this way or this way. Which one is better? The one that has the inside in the numerator. So this one is better because the inside is on the top. 
this is probably the one written in your textbook. Now, please don't write it like this for your professor because he sucks at math and he will, oh, well, it's just supposed to be a negative. What are you doing here? This is not true. Because he sucks at math. He doesn't know that if you change the sign, you can flip them. He's a professor at medical school, so come down, right? Just try to please him. As you know, the potassium inside is 140 to 4, so 35 times more on the inside. The sodium is the opposite, 14 to 140. Now, can we use these numbers to actually solve for the Nernst equation? Sure. Here is the Nernst equation. Let's do it once for potassium, and then we can do it for sodium. Perfect. Let's do it for potassium. Okay. Negative 61 is not going to change. Times logarithm is not going to change. Potassium inside over potassium outside. I've just told you that the potassium is inside is about 140 milli equivalents per liter, and the potassium outside is about only four. You do it like this, use your calculator, it is negative 94 millivolts. What the flip does that mean? It means that if potassium was the only game in town without sodium, without chloride, without calcium, the arresting membrane potential would equal negative 94 millivolts. Okay, that's awesome. How about sodium? Do the same thing. Negative 61 is not going to change. Look at them. Sodium inside, start with the inside over the outside. If you start with the inside, this has to be a negative sign. Negative 61 times log 14 over 140. There is more sodium on the outside than in the inside. And then use your calculator, or you can do it using your brain because this is log, like the root here is 10. So 10 power x equals 1 over 10. Of course, the x is negative 1. So negative times negative is positive, 61 millivolt. What the flip does that mean? It means that if sodium was the only game in town, the resting membrane potential would equal 61 millivolts. In reality, however, you know that the resting membrane potential is negative 90. So which one contributes more to the resting membrane potential? The potassium efflux or the sodium influx? Which one is closer to the negative 90? Of course, the potassium. This is negative 94. Very close to the negative 90. But look at the sodium. It's way, 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 way far away from the negative 90. And that's why the resting membrane potential is largely caused by the potassium efflux, not by the sodium influx, relatively speaking. And this is the genius of Nernest. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Nernest has proven once and for all that the polarized state is caused by the potassium efflux. That was Nernest. How about Goldman? Goldman is trying to answer a completely different question. Which one is more important, the selective permeability or the sodium potassium ATPase pump when it comes to the causes of the resting membrane potential? Here is what Goldman said. Uh, Goldman, okay, so uh, I will play with three ions. Sodium, potassium, and chloride. Okay. And I know that there are two contributing factors. The concentration gradient, well, is potassium more abundant outside or inside? Is sodium more abundant outside or inside? And the membrane permeability. How does the membrane like you? Does the membrane let you, let you go? Or does it not let you go? Is it permeable to you or impermeable to you? So these are the two factors. Okay, and then you do it for each one. So the E, which is the potential difference, equals negative 61 times the log. You start with the inside on the top, outside at the bottom. What are the two factors? The concentration gradient times the permeability. Since these are the two factors, you multiply them by each other. Do it once for sodium, once for potassium, and once for chloride. And when you do this equation, you will find that E equals negative 86 millivolts. In reality, however, you know that the resting membrane potential is negative 90 millivolts. Is negative 86 close to negative 90? Yeah, it is close enough, very close. Which means that the selective permeability is way, 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 way more important than the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Because look at this, the selective permeability accounts for 86 out of the 90, leaving only 4 for the stinking sodium potassium ATPase pump. So Goldman has proven once and for all that the selective permeability is way, 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 way more important than the sodium potassium ATPase when it comes to the resting membrane potential. A quick note about the sodium potassium ATPase pump. So we started like this. There was three sodium inside and two potassium outside. And then the pump is gonna flip, it's gonna rotate, pushing the three sodiums to the outside and the two potassiums to the inside. Notice that the pump pushes three sodium out 
against two gradients, but it pushes the potassiums in against one gradient. Let me explain. You're pushing the sodium outside, right? Yes. And you know that sodium is the most abundant ion in the extracellular fluid? Yes. Therefore, they are pushing sodium against the concentration gradient. Everybody say yes? Yes. Moreover, you know that during rest, the inside is negative, which means the outside is positive. You're pushing the sodium, positive, against positive. So you're pushing it against the electrical gradient as well. That makes perfect sense. Let me tell you about the potassium story. You're pushing two potassiums inside. True. And you know that there is more potassium inside than outside. True. Therefore, the pump is pushing the potassium in against the concentration gradient. Everybody say yes. Yes. But look at the electrical gradient. The inside is negative during rest. We are pushing the positive inside. Pushing the positive towards the negative is not against the electrical gradient. It's actually with the electrical gradient. Therefore, you are only pushing the potassium against one gradient. Now, question of the day. When it comes to voltage-gated channels, you have sodium voltage-gated channel and voltage-gated potassium channel. This one has two gates, this one has one gate. Now, sodium channels are fast. The question is why? Potassium channels are slow. Why? Let me know the answers in the comment section. You'll find the answers in the next video. If you like this discussion on the Nernus equation, check out my video on the Donan's equilibrium. It was even more epic. See how Milton Friedman and Thomas Sowell can teach you something about the Donnan equilibrium. If you want to learn more about the acid-base imbalance, check out my course on my website, medicosisperfectionalis.com. 30 videos with cases, notes, etc. 8 gigabytes of acid-base content. Also, I have a CNS pharmacology course. Learn about opiates, anesthetics, stimulants, sedatives, hypnotics, anti-Parkinson's, anti-psychotics, anti-depressants, and anti-epileptic medications. And you can get a 25% discount towards any Anything on my website, use promo code SAFE25, available for 11 students only. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my premium courses. Go to Picmonic for some doozy medical mnemonics. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.